Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to this fireside chat with uh, Professor Joe Beale. Today, we'll be talking about Professor Beale's work and, and also about, uh, especially about the challenges facing African cities. Um, I'm really very pleased to be here today with Professor Beale. As many of you will certainly know, she's a professor and distinguished research fellow at the London School of Economics. And she's conducted research in, in Africa and in Asia on urban development and governance, as well as in um, as well as on cities in situations of conflict and, and state fragility. She's executive director of the education and of education and society for the British Council, formerly deputy vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town. Um, and among other positions, she is on the wider UNU wider board, and she is also a member of the advisory group of the African Cities Research Consortium. So the African Cities Research Consortium is a, a new research consortium led by the University of Manchester with um, nine, I believe it's nine core partners, um, including UNU wider. Uh, it's a very exciting group. We're really um, excited to be a part of it. Uh, and the, the aim of the consortium is to provide new insights to enable African cities to be more productive, equitable, and inclusive. Um, so we're really excited to talk with you about all of that today. Uh, and um, just to introduce myself, my name is Rachel Gislequist. I'm a senior research fellow here at UNU Wider. I'm a political scientist. Um, I work on some, some, some related issues. So I work on issues of state fragility and governance. Uh, on African politics. Um, I usually work more at the national or the state level, and so I'm, I'm really interested to hear, as time permits, about uh, you know, some of the, the comparisons of work at the city versus the national level and what we can learn uh, from each other. Um, so the way this call will work, this, this chat will work, is we'll kick off the discussion uh, and then we'll open up to, to you in the, in the audience. I see there's a number of people here um, and as time permits, I'm going to try to unmute you um, to pose questions, but please also feel free to pose questions in the Q&A box um, and be ready to be unmuted so we can, we can have a nice conversation together. But why don't we kick off and, and let me ask Joe, um, how did you become interested in, in work in this area, in work on, on African urban development? Well, um, by default rather than design, actually, because um, my early work was on women's organization in the city of Durban mm -hmm. when I was um, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, and I, I had to leave South Africa under the apartheid period, arrived in the UK and discovered that what I did as local research uh, fell in under the rubric of development studies. And so it was at the Institute um, of Development Studies that I did my first work in the UK, mainly on gender and mainly um, learning how what I was doing fitted within this, uh, this broad interdisciplinary field of development studies. And from there, I went to the development planning unit at uh, the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL. Mm. And of course, in that context, became deeply uh, embedded in all issues urban. And um, for a long time worked on gender issues in cities and in urban planning. Uh, and, and women in cities. And from, then from there, I went to the London School of Economics, where I was for nearly 20 years, and um, broadened out in two ways. One, my interest in gender became an interest in um, social relations and social dynamics more generally. Mm -hmm. And my interest in cities uh, narrowed, if you like, to looking at uh, issues of urban poverty, uh, urban uh, services development and urban governance. And um, it's really from those beginnings that I became an urbanist, not the usual route of geography or urban planning. <laughs> ah, oh, that's really interesting. 
Um, I wonder, yeah, maybe it would be interesting to know, you know, uh, thinking about the various projects you've been involved with, what, what are, you know, what is the most exciting one or one or two of the most exciting or rewarding yeah. ones that you've been a, a part of? So um, it's, oh, it's a difficult question because I've been involved in many and all of them were exciting. I think early projects, um, such as the one I did, in fact, um, with Manchester and University of Birmingham on urban poverty and urban governance, that was in the um, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, that was a fascinating project because at that point, development studies was not interested in the urban as a field it was focused on rural development as a field to the extent urban issues or cities came into it, it was through a focus on industrialization policy um, and so there was a long battle really to get uh, cities on the agenda mm. and I think that project was one that played a part um, you know first it was scholars challenging what the dominant thinking was, which uh, was very much framed by Michael Lipton's urban bias thesis mm -hmm. and the notion that the poor were in rural areas, that mm -hmm. urban dwellers had access to decision makers and could mold policy to their own interests. And scholars like Gareth Jones and Stuart Corbridge challenged that. We challenged that by looking at the dynamics and dimensions of urban poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, not setting it up as an either or to rural poverty, but rather setting it up as um, an area of uh, investigation in its own right, with its own characteristics, its own problems and its own solutions. Um, it was also at a time when um, the World Bank and UNDP had um, both put out urban policy papers that was in the in 1991. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, during that whole decade and into the 2000s, into this century, progress was very slow. I think it's different now. We take uh, an urban focus for granted um, because of the, and we now have an urban SDG, um, you know, which was a great triumph uh, and the result of a lot of lobbying and hard work on the part of urban policymakers and academics. Um, so I think that was very, very much an exciting project. I think um, the one I'm involved in now, uh, which is looking at interdisciplinary issues uh, mm -hmm. as a way of addressing cities is, um, is also important. So um, in the 2000s, leading up to a publication by Oxford University Press in 2010, I was involved in a UNU wider project on multidisciplinary approaches to urbanization. And that oh, was, yeah. Do you remember that one? Um, I do, yeah. Was, <laughs> that was a precursor to some of the work going on now, looking at interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinary perspectives. But the, at that time, Ravi Kamba uh, and I were focused very much on multidisciplinary approaches within the social sciences and a lot of what we dealt with was how economists and the softer social sciences viewed and approached cities the differences mm -hmm. between and how working together would lead to more efficacious solutions um, the work i'm involved in now is uh, with a much broader group of disciplines including engineers and architects so looking um, not just the social sciences and the work um, is on urban sanitation and waste management and um, is it's very challenging because you know engineers are trained to think about the weight at which a bridge might collapse and social scientists are trained to think about the people crossing the bridge and sleeping under the bridge and um, and so coming together uh in a broader uh in the broader scope of interdisciplinarity has been very exciting mm -hmm. how do you um have you do you have any tips for facilitating these these interdisciplinary discussions has, what what sort of uh um how has it worked 
<laughs> or not worked. <laughs> well, the obvious one is is to to listen, to listen, um, but also to be heard. Um, and I, I think, I mean, work that I've done with um, Addis Ababa uh, mm -hmm. in an interdisciplinary sanitation project involved iterative engagement. So, mm -hmm. you know, often you're talk, talking at cross purposes initially, but you come back with some evidence you bring forward some perspectives and insights that provide the aha moment for people from another discipline and eventually you come to some compromise uh, or, or some uh, some common understanding and i think the best you can hope for is a common language and a common approach i'm not sure it's sustained always people do go back into their disciplinary boxes oh. but um you know if we've taken 30 years to get urbanization firmly on the agenda. <laughs> I think we've got to wait quite a long time and be persistent over another couple of decades to get the interdisciplinary pro approaches really embedded. Mm -hmm. um, so I could keep asking you questions, but I, I see there's already uh, at least one question here in the Q&A box. Um, Salam al-Rabadi, are you here? Can you unmute yourself? Can you request to be uh, to speak? If not, I can ask the question and then others in the audience, there are a lot of people I see here who I know would have great questions. Please do um, feel free to request to, to speak and then you can pose a question. But we have one question here from uh, Salam al-Rabadi. Um, he says, in terms of reading or analyzing the history and development of the global economy, how can we read the reality of the World Trade Organization? I wonder if you have have thoughts, any thoughts about that? Um, or we can collect a few questions too and then come back. It's a broad question. It, I, yeah, I mean, if I bring that question to um, a city's focus, I think what's very interesting is that world trade um, happens around urban hubs. Um, mm. and there is a, net, a global network of cities that are um, around which trade is concentrated. Uh, and of course, when you think about how global organizations like the World Trade Organization, the UN, the World Bank, they are all, invariably organized at a national level mm -hmm. and cities are outside of global governance. Um, and yet, whether you're talking about trade whether you're talking about um, rebuilding post-COVID, uh, whether you're talking about um, global governance, you, it's very difficult to think about it without cities being there as part of a sort of multi-level, multi-dimensional governance uh, process. So, so that would be my, my take on that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's another question here from Kala Sridhar. Would you like to unmute yourself if you can? Well, I can, I'll pose the question then. It seems that unmuting is not working so well. Uh, so it, uh, the, um, the question, the comment is, Dr. Beale, very interesting discussion. How would you distinguish the experience of African cities from those of Indian cities, especially during the pandemic? Very interesting question. Um, I mean, if you if you look at uh, the African Cities Research Consortium, which is focused on African cities, when that was first conceived, there was a lot of discussion around mm -hmm. why why Africa, um, as Rachel will know. Um, and in some ways, you could argue that. Uh, African cities represent cities um, in in the global south in challenging conditions um, very well. Mm -hmm. um, in other ways, of course, there are uh, specificities. So, what what's common with Asia? Um, I would say they're fast growing. Um, so. Africa as a continent is the most rapidly urbanizing continent. 
um, cities of South Asia already urbanized. Um, so Africa is urbanizing off, off a lower base, if you like. Um, I think um, rural urban migration in African cities uh, is often circular. Um, not always, but often um, people keep routes to rural areas in various ways uh, mm -hmm. in a way that um, is not always open to uh, urban dwellers in South Asian cities. Mm. Um, so those would be two immediate thoughts. Um, of course, the size and complexity of South Asian cities is often, it often dwarfs what we're looking at in mm -hmm. Africa. Um, but if you look at um, some of the large slums in cities like Mumbai and Nairobi, Kabira, for example, a lot of the issues, a lot of the problems, a lot of the opportunities are the same. You have populations of ur urban strivers who make it against the odds, who are becoming micro entrepreneurs in the context of uh, slum economies um, and you know a lot of th those lessons would be useful for other parts of the world to learn mm -hmm. so we have another question here um, from agneta nyabundi uh whoops yes uh, kindly address the aspect of urban areas uh, and its hinterlands in the wake of COVID the covid 19 pandemic given the fluid nature of urban and rural divides in Africa? Uh, another excellent question, and one that um, people have been addressing in this conference uh, very, um, very extensively. Um, I mean, I think the first thing to say is um, cities are at the heart of the COVID pandemic. They are th the theatres, if you like, of the crisis. Um, it's not to say that uh, the pandemic hasn't extended to rural areas, but it's concentrated in cities. That's uh, the first thing to say. The second is that the links between cities mean, uh, and migration between them, uh, mean that uh, they are vectors. So if you, Environment and Urbanization recently published a very interesting article by Caroline Moser, mm -hmm. where she looks at um, a, a small, not very well known city in Ecuador, Guayaquil, and um, the migration for work of people from Guayaquil to Spain. When the pandemic hit Europe, um, Italy first and Spain, people moved back and there was a, a devastating impact on the city. Mm -hmm. So we're not just talking about um, small areas, but globally, you're having that mobility uh, impacting on cities. I think um, yesterday we heard in uh, this, this conference um, on um, the experience of research done by WeGo on the informal economy. Um, and in that session, it was made uh, very clear that the informal um, sector, workers in the informal economy uh, experienced a much worse impact, recovered much more slowly. And in my area of work, which is on solid waste management, which includes recycling and waste picking and rag picking, even in that area, the waste generated has been less during the pandemic. The dump sites have been closed, so access to existing waste has not been there. And that's ne devastatingly and negatively impacted um, on the poorest people in, in an economy. And then when you start thinking about um, rebuilding cities post COVID, mm -hmm. Um, you have to think again about the governance issues. And Rachel, you, you're a political uh, scientist. You know how important um, political inclusion is. And I would argue that political inclusion needs to include being able to see like a city, mm -hmm. not doing 
things to cities, but including cities in the post-COVID reconstruction decision-making processes. Um, colleagues at LSE are involved in um, the EGI and uh, the Emergency Governance Initiative, which is a big project with uh, the United Cities and local government organization and, and metropolis. And they're looking at the urban governance dimensions of rapid and radical action in response to global emergencies. And it was initially set up to look at things like climate change and cities and climate change. But of course, COVID has overtaken everything. And they have been there to, to look at um, how in cities it's not, it's a health issue, yes, but it's not only a health issue. Um, Issues of environmental sustainability, very old, uh, long-standing dimensions like um, urban services, water, sanitation, waste management, they are critical to um, recovery and prevention with regard to pandemics. You know, people are washing their hands, but they're throwing their rubbish into drains that then block and lead to diseases like dengue, which uh, constitute a really toxic mix when it's combined with COVID in cities like Karachi, where I'm working at the moment. So um, I would say that cities have to be at the heart of any thinking about how we prevent future academics, uh, pandemics and deal with current ones. I wonder uh, in building on that, where. What do you see as the as a member of the advisory group for the ACRC? What do you see as the the um, the space for, for the consortium's work? Where would you where might you like to see it going, and where how do you see the consortium's work fitting into to those challenges? Well, I think um, one of the core challenges that um the african cities research consortium is tackling is inequalities mm -hmm. um and um i think it was the the head of the the, the secretary general of the un said urban inequalities are at the crux of of how we deal with covid dealing with urban inequalities and um ACRC are looking not only at economic uh, and social inequalities, but also at political inequalities and political exclusions. And I think, you know, apropos of what I've been saying about urban governance, that is at the heart of what needs to be done. And I think that there isn't a research um, project at the moment that is better poised to address some of those issues. I think also um, the fact that um, ACRC treats cities as systems mm -hmm. and pandemics as part of complex emergencies, I think that bodes well for um, bringing to the fore in the interdisciplinary approaches that we need to address complex emergencies like pandemics. And I think lastly, um, the fact that um, ACRC is a consortium, it's got all the strengths of Manchester, but it's not just Manchester, it's got partners all over Africa. Um, the fact that it um, is drawing on that strength of scholars and practitioners across the, the, the continent, uh, puts it in a very good position. Where it goes next, um, I, th I think, you know, talking to the funders rather than the team is what is the next subcontinent you're going to take these lessons to. And, you know, for me, South Asia would be an obvious one um, because there is, a, you know, like your earlier questioner uh, intimated, there are so many lessons to be learned uh, and shared across the two subcontinents. Thank you so much. This is, um, we're at the end of our time. Unfortunately, there's some other great questions in the chat. Um, but I think that I've been under strict orders to end on time <laughs> so that we can get to the, to so that others can go to other sessions. But I really would like to thank you, Joe, for, for joining us today in this fireside chat.
and to the audience members and especially those who raised questions. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us. And thank you, Rachel, and everyone for really great questions. I've enjoyed it.